Morning, everybody. This is Tim Melvin of Banking on Profits and the Community Bank Stock Investor, our monthly publication, coming to you once again from down here in Central Florida on another just beautiful day. Uh, had a little rain this weekend, but that's all kind of blown out of here and uh, just going to be a, a bright, sunshiny kind of day. That was the reason I moved to Florida in the first place. You know, the big news this morning is, is that Richard Thaler has won the Nobel Prize in Economics for his work in behavioral finance. Now, I'm a big fan of Mr. Thaler's work. We've used it uh, over the years to develop many of our own investing strategies. And what's neat about Richard Thaler is, is that he's not just an ivory tower academic. He actually has an asset management fund, full on Thaler Asset Management, that has been crushing the market since they opened their doors. Now, when you look at their holdings right now and you kind of go through their 13F and you ask yourselves, and look, what do these guys own? Why are they doing so well? They own a lot of small community and regional banks, guys. And they also own some of the same real estate things that I've talked about over the years uh, that have done so very well for us. So congratulations to Mr. Thaler. Absolutely thrilled to see him uh, gain the acknowledgement that he so deserves. So Anyway, the National Survey of Community Banking in the 21st Century, a paper done every year by the Federal Reserve as part of their Community Bank Research Conference, was released. And in the survey that they that they did, uh, the bankers are all they're saying the same things they've been saying for a couple of years now. Biggest concerns, regulatory costs. Uh, that's been kind of pushed to the back. You know, everybody's hoping for regulatory reform, but the bankers are still of the opinion that uh, for the smaller banks in particular, the costs are prohibitive. It makes them very non-competitive, very difficult to increase the bottom line. And it's a major factor and concern in the community bank space. And um, yeah, I've got my uh, Harry and Lannister shirt on today. I drink and I know things. One of the greatest quotes from any show ever. My wife got me the shirt. So um, regulatory reform is not happening as quickly as everybody would like to see. A lot of foot dragging, no cost savings coming down to the community bank so far. And that's a, that's a problem. Other concerns are continued uh, increasing competition from fintech and other non-bank lenders, particularly in the personal loan space. They're not really having a huge impact in the um, in the commercial side just yet, but they are a growing presence in mortgages and personal loans like credit cards and that type of thing. You know, fintech is real. It's not going away. I don't think it's going to replace banks. It's going to be more, I think, of a partnership. But for now, it's still a pretty competitive environment. On the commercial side, you know, this is really just a bank on bank dogfight for the commercial and small business loans uh, in the United States right now. The fintech lenders, the outside, you know, non bank lenders, not really a presence in this market. But we are seeing credit unions. Try to make a stronger entry into this market because commercial loans have better interest rates than uh, most of the personal loans and certainly mortgage loans that have been there stable forever. So on every front, it's an increasingly competitive uh, environment for the small banks and there's nothing being done that's helping them on the regulatory side and they're finding it very difficult to compete on the technology side. And that's becoming a huge expense as well as so everything goes mobile and digital. Then you have cybersecurity concerns that you have to lay on top of that. And that's very expensive. So that is, by the way, leading to continued consolidation, according to the survey. We got lots of buyers, OK, uh, larger community and regional banks that they need to grow earnings. They've got outside investors. They're publicly traded companies and their measurement in the marketplace is how much are you growing? bottom line earnings. Well, it's a 2% economy. And according to the Fed, I mean, we had a great last quarter, but they're looking the next year and saying, look, two, two and a half. That's where we live now. It's not going to get a lot better anytime soon, if ever. Two to two and a half is kind of the new normal. That's a very difficult environment for banks to make money in. So the only way to grow earnings is to buy other banks. And fortunately, the smaller banks, these guys truly are, they're disgusted. They're tired. They are suffering in a big way from tired banker syndrome. Many of them are getting older and they're looking for liquidity as an exit. So selling to a larger bank that's got a higher multiple stock, that's you know uh, much more liquid and heavily traded where you can put together an exit strategy makes more and more sense for these guys. So we saw some acceleration in August. 
little pause in September. I think we pick up as we head into the end of the year and accelerate in 2018 on the M&A side. And that's great news for us because we got a portfolio just full of potential M&A candidates. So the big bank earnings this week, uh, we've got the City and JP Morgan are on Thursday. Uh, Bank of America, PNC um, on uh on Friday, I think Wells is on Wednesday, if memory serves correctly. Now, we'll watch those. We'll go through them. We'll read them. But don't read too much into them, okay, because they're not necessarily very well correlated with the smaller community banks that we own. The bigger banks are in a lot of businesses, you know, investment banking, trading, uh, market, all kinds of stuff. There are banks. They're just not in that business. So... The things that are happening at the big banks, that's not necessarily going to be replicated down at the smaller banks. The best part of big bank earnings, especially in the last year or so, is Jamie Dimon's conference call because he just has thrown all his filters away and he goes off on a wide range of subjects, some economic, some political, but they've been a lot of fun to listen to. So I'm looking forward to the call and a whole bunch of quotes later this week. Jason Zweig was out with a fantastic column in the Wall Street Journal this weekend, if you missed it. It's called Income Investors. It's okay to be sad. Don't get desperate. Guys, we've been in a low-rate environment for a long time. It looks like we're going to stay here for a long time. A lot of money has come into the market over the last five or six years looking for an income stream. And, you know, first they hit the blue chip stocks. Then they went to some of the larger cap REITs, the high yield bond ETFs. They're really out there aggressively looking for income. A lot of this stuff is very pricey on a valuation basis. Um, if we get any kind of blip in, in interest rates related to the Fed's unwind of its balance sheet or too much leverage being taken uh, by some of these companies and investments, things could go horribly wrong. I have seen more money lost. Uh, by chasing yield than anything else in three decades around the, the, the financial market. And that includes options and futures trading. In pure dollar volume, more money has been lost by people reaching for yield than anything else. If you need yield and income, resist the temptation to do stupid things. Just, you know, our kind of new normal there has been things like Bank X, um, the uh, a bank, almost private equity uh, type fund run by Stone Castle Financial, that invest in community bank stock, um, debentures, preferred stocks, senior loans, that type of thing, as well as some common equity, getting right around a 7% yield, trading at a slight discount to the net asset value. Brilliant guys running the thing. If you need income, I think that's a great place to look. Um, if you need uh, outside of retirement plan, there are still some tax-free funds, particularly on the single state side. Where I don't think you're taking a lot of risk, but you can buy them at a double-digit discount, which is historically pretty average. There are some states, Illinois, California to a lesser degree, they've got real problems and the price of their bonds are quite likely to continue uh, to feel some pressure. Same for anybody that's uh, been unfortunate enough to get stuck with large Puerto Rican municipal bond positions in, in, their, uh, in their bond portfolios or bond funds. But uh, there are some states, uh, my old home state of Maryland, uh, you know, they never saw anything they couldn't tax, and that's not great for the folks that live there, but it's wonderful for the state budget and the credit quality uh, of the municipal bonds issued by the state. North Carolina, um, funds are trading at a discount, offering above average yields. Same for Michigan, where everybody thinks, oh, Michigan, Detroit. No, Western Michigan is on fire, guys, and Detroit's actually, to some degree, come back. So it looks to me like Michigan's actually not a bad credit. You can buy these closed-end funds. Um, Nuveen's got a bunch of them for the different states. They're at solid discounts. And there's a couple of the uh, national funds that have very low Puerto Rican exposure, non-existent in some cases. You have to go through the portfolio. Nobody told you this would be easy, okay? But uh, you can get four and a half, five, maybe five and a quarter uh, tax-free yields from these funds. They're pretty conservative, Um you got to kind of keep an eye on interest rates and what's going on in the world to have them in the portfolio. They're not buy and own forever investments, but they are pretty safe uh, portfolios. You can buy at a discount to net asset value. Many of them have some outside activist investor involvement, which, as you know, we love in any of the investments that we get involved in. Uh, so that's an option. And I still like uh, Halloween Lift Star as a long term income producing company. And that dividend's right around 8% today. So there's just a couple of income ideas. 
Anyway, read the column by Jason Zweig, <coughs> and it is okay to be sad. It's hard to earn a high income here, but don't get desperate. Don't chase yields. If you don't understand it, don't buy it. That's a great rule of thumb. Okay. Wife has been gone all weekend. She's back up to Chicago uh, for my oldest daughter's uh, baby shower. Took the youngest with her. Uh, so they've been up there, and they've, of course, they went to the baby shower. They've had a fantastic time corn around the city of Chicago. They took the architectural boat ride. They're having fun. And I got to spend some quality time with a very angry cat who just wanders around the house yelling at me and a pouty dog. See, to those animals, she is the sun and the moon and everything in between. I'm an appliance. And they're not happy that they had to spend the weekend with the appliance. But she'll be back tonight and all will be back to normal. But it did provide a great chance for some, you know, marathon book reading and just tons of playoff baseball. My goodness, we have already seen some fantastic baseball games uh, this weekend, uh, and it continues today. Today is like baseball nirvana. We have four games, four playoff games, starting at one o'clock, going all the way up till tonight. I'm pretty excited about it. Uh, I have to take a break later today to run and pick her up at the airport, but other than that, uh, we'll be doing a lot of work and doing some research and watching a ton of baseball around Shea Melvin today. We did get some great reading done. Uh, the Todd Mercer Extraditionist series. This is the first book in a new uh, kind of lawyer novel uh, series. Uh, in Bluestone is the, is the name of the lawyer, and I guess that's what they're going to call the series. It was a really solid read, guys. Uh, this guy knows his way around uh, some esoteric corners of the legal field, and he exposes you to him in the novel. Great adventure. I really enjoyed it. Thought it was a great, fun read. Uh, just started yesterday. The Big Chair by Ned Coletti. Now, this is uh, Ned Coletti was the general manager of um, the Los Angeles Dodgers in the late 90s up to the early part of the 2000s. Just fantastic story. There was a lot going on back then. If you remember, uh, the McCourt family sold the team during that time to Guggenheim Partners and Magic Johnson. So we're kind of mixing up baseball and finance, two of my favorite areas. I'm only about 20% of the way in, but I got to tell you, so far, this is a solid book and one of the better baseball books I've read in the last couple of years. So um, that's about all I've got for you right now, guys. There's um, no big changes in the overall market from uh, the last few weeks. Uh, we're kind of perking along. We're coming into earnings season, so it could get a little bit more interesting. The biggest risks are geopolitical, North Korea being the biggest player there, but there's issues in China. You know, Mr. Putin in Russia is a huge wild card. In the Middle East, you just never know what's going to happen in the Middle East that could shock and roil the market. So that's a huge risk. Some concern about the Fed's unwinding of the balance sheet, but so far the market seems to be taking that one in stride. Um, I think they can deal with the not reinvesting the money that's coming in. As long as they're not actively selling bonds, the market's going to be um, a little bit complacent about that as they have been just about everything happened the last few years. The biggest risks in my mind are geopolitical. We're doing fantastic. We're having another just great year in the main portfolio. We're matching the relevant indexes with um, you know over 20% cash and a tail hedge in place. Perfectly thrilled with that portfolio um, as we continue on a long-term basis to solidly outperform. Now the two smaller portfolios uh, the bonus banks uh, that are only available to subscribers of banking on profit. Uh, those are the teeny tiny ones. Um, that are too small to be included in the main portfolio. They are crushing the market by a huge margin, as are the focus stocks that we put into our monthly community bank stock investor. I think we're up something like 40% in that portfolio so far this year. So we're on track for another great year. In the main portfolio, we're completely, you know, we're in just a great place no matter what happens. If the market goes down, we've got cash to put to work. We've got a hedge in place. Most of the smaller banks in the focus and bonus portfolios are somewhat impervious to overall market action because they're not in any ETFs. The big hedge funds don't own them, so we're in good shape. Anyway, that's about all I've got for you this week. Once again, congratulations to Richard Thaler for winning the Nobel Prize in Economics. Enjoy the week of playoff baseball. This is going to be fantastic, guys, leading up to the championship series and then, of course, the World Series afterwards. This is simply a great time to be a baseball fan. Anyway, guys. Have a great week and we'll talk to you next week.